Greetings. My name is Melvin Jones and I am the ministering evangelist of the Southwest Church of Christ located at 380 Franklin Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'd like to welcome you all to our YouTube channel. And I pray that this message will enrich your life and cause you to make a radical change for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks again for tuning in and may God bless you. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Did you wake up this morning with your mind on Jesus? Yes. yes that's why you are here today. Because you woke up this morning with your mind on Jesus. In spite of how tired you are. In spite of the turkey hangover. In spite of problems, issues, and circumstances. Your mind was on Jesus. And so you are here today. There are some people that woke up with their mind on Jesus, but because of physical situations, they couldn't be with us. So let us keep them all in our prayers. Church, I have to say that I missed y'all last week. When I'm out of town, it just seems like something is missing, you know? And it's so good to be home. And like somebody once said, there is no place like home. And that is the honest to God truth. So we certainly appreciate everybody that is here, all our visitors and guests. You are welcome to the Church of Christ, some friends we haven't met, and we look forward to meeting you at the appointed time. I haven't preached in two weeks, y'all, so fast and y'all see y'all get ready to take a trip to Australia. <laughs> That's like 24 hours. <laughs> no, we ain't gonna be long. Y'all sit there and be like, oh, Lord, I ain't eat this morning. <laughs> the roast is in the oven all slow. I should have turned it off. We ain't gonna keep y'all on this morning. Y'all know I love basketball. And because of an injury, I, I can't play it anymore and I miss the sport so very much. And so all I can do is watch it and observe it, and soak it in. Sometimes I get overexcited and say, oh, that was a nice move. I'm gonna try that when I get back. Can't try it no more. So all I can do is like observe the game really closely. <clears throat> and you know, when basketball players commit a violation, uh, the referee blows the whistle. And uh, he ends all of the action. The court stops abruptly. And he points to the offending player, indicating what the violation was, whether it was travel, whether it was a foul, double dribble, or whatever the violation is. Well, rules, fouls, and penalties are part of any game and are regulated and enforced vigorously by referees, umpires, and judges. Every participant of that sporting event knows the boundaries. They will talk the boundaries. And there are behaviors that must be set, behaviors that must be monitored during the sporting event. Otherwise, there's complete chaos. Well, there are laws and boundaries in the laws of life. Amen, somebody. And these boundaries are established by God. And sometimes, you and I, we violate these rules and God blows his spiritual whistle. Now, unlike a basketball game, after so many violations, one can be uh, ejected from the game or the coach may just sit him or her on the bench. But with God, when we violate his ordinances, his precepts, his laws, and his rules, he blows his spiritual whistle via the word of God. But see, God does not blow his whistle to kick you out of the game. He blows his whistle so you can have grace to stay in the game. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. In a sporting event, there are statisticians, if I pronounce that correctly. Statisticians, and they keep records of all your points, but not just all your points. They keep record of all your fouls, all your violations and all your wrongdoings during the game. In this life, the devil is the statistician. Keeping track, keeping record of all your fouls, all your violations, and all your wrongdoings. The word devil means accuser. He is a false accuser. And he wants to continuously remind God of our violations. And he will add some violations to 
your violation. In a basketball game in the NBA, if you commit six fouls, you're out of the game. Well, the devil said, he done committed nine fouls. No, I only got six. The devil's a liar. He will add to your violations. But I'm grateful that the Bible tells us in Romans chapter number four and verse number eight, blessed is the man who the Lord shall not impute his sin. The word impute means to keep record of. Church, we are blessed beyond measure because heaven does not keep record of our sin. Oh, that's a blessing in itself. Amen. Oh, that was a shouting moment. Because I'm glad they don't keep record of the stuff I do. And y'all ought to be glad they don't keep record of the stuff y'all do. Now, even though we all have a record, we all got a rap sheet. Some longer than others. By God's grace, there are no record of our wrongdoings, even though we are wrong. Church, I need to tell you that every day, we ought to thank God for his goodness. Because he doesn't keep record of the stuff that we do. As a matter of fact, that's the name of the sermon. Thank God for his goodness. The text that was read from your hearing this morning came from the book of Nahum. Nahum is a minor prophet with a major message. The word Nahum in Hebrew literature, it means comfort and consolation. The book of Nahum is like a sequel to the book of Jonah. About a hundred years earlier, Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria. Jonah entered that city preaching a message of impending judgment. When the Ninevites heard the message of Jonah, they repented of their sins, and the Lord spared that city. Well, a century has passed now, and, and they have turned away from their commitment to the Lord. And by the time the book of Nahum is written, the Assyrian Empire was at the height of its military power and at the height of national power. So God punished the Syria for their disobedience and their hatred towards the people of God. Nahum means comfort and consolation. That's a strange name for a book that talks about judgment and doom. It's a book of harsh pronouncements and, and doom against the people that have abandoned the ways of God. But while Nahum's message is a message of judgment and wrath, there is one bright spot in this text that I want to dwell on. Thank God that there is always a bright spot in the midst of doom and judgment. And I'm referring to in verse 7. See, in the midst of wrath and doom, in the midst of anger, this verse stands out like a, like a shining beacon of hope on a dark and stormy night. We live in a world where there's just way too many stormy nights, and we need a bright spot in our lives. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, he says, the Lord is good in spite of all that stuff going on. So let's take a look at this text, and, and let's gain an appreciation and more of an appreciation of the goodness of God. Notice Nahum chapter 7, chapter 1, verse number 2. The Bible says God is jealous, and the Lord is revenged. The Lord revenged and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and reserve wrath for his enemies. Notice the text that, that God is jealous. He's a jealous God. You know, when you think about somebody that you care dearly for, somebody that you spend a lot of time with, somebody you go way back with, and then the next thing you know, somebody comes out of nowhere, gains a, a relationship with this person that you care for, and it kind of disrupts your relationship with that person. We may have a tendency to become jealous. Think about that for a second. 
Now this person is going to the movies with your friend. Going out to dinner with your friend. Don't let it be a, 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 a man and woman relationship. I'm talking about a man that was born with manly parts and a woman born with womanly parts. Man and woman, y'all don't hear me this morning. A man and a woman relationship. And then the next thing you know, somebody comes along and, and now your husband is bowling every Friday night. Your wife is going out for tea. Somebody has came and disrupts that relationship. Uh, or, or let it be two friends and two females and, a, and another female come along and now we don't go to the movies no more. Go get our hair done. Oh, y'all yeah, ain't called me. Y'all could have called me when y'all was going to get a manny and a penny. <laughs> I ain't know. And so the relationship is disrupted. And we can become jealous of those relationships. It happens with marriages and relationships and friendships and, and church members. Somebody get added to the body of Christ. May have something in common with somebody, but me and you, we, we, been, we go way back. But here comes a new member. And sometimes we get jealous of those relationships. Even in the Bible, we see that Saul became jealous of David's relationship with Israel, with Jonathan. There was a man named Elkanah. He had two wives. One name was Peninnah and one name was Hannah. Peninnah had a bunch of kids by Elkanah, but Hannah couldn't have no kids. But yet, Peninnah was jealous of Hannah. Why? Because Elkanah gave her the best spot at the dinner table. She got the best food. She was treated like he spent more time in her tent than her tent. Oh, y'all. Jealous! <laughs> <Jonas! laughs> Cain was jealous of Abel. Reuben and his brothers was jealous of Joseph. And the list goes on and on. And sometimes this jealousy can lead to envy and strife and vengeance. Yes. Most of the time, jealousy is a product of, of selfishness, of what I want. I want what you have. Now let me try to encourage Job, encourage those that may have a spirit of jealousy. Stop counting somebody else's blessings and just count your own blessings. Amen. 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 That's all jealous people do. They're always looking at what you got. Yeah. Stop counting their blessings and be thankful for the blessings that you have. Now, jealousy in this text, after talking about it with a negative connotation, can be a surprising term when it's associated with God. God is not tainted with the negative connotation of this verb. His holiness does not tolerate competitors or those who sin against him. Let's go to Sunday school right quick. Turn your Bibles to, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. I'm sorry, make that 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. See, it is appropriate for God to insist on our complete alliance with him and to execute judgment on those who do not want a relationship with him. His jealousy and vengeance is not mixed with strife. Now, Paul gives us a great example and a lesson on what God's jealousy is like. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's look at verse 2. What does that say, my brother? For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. See that? He's jealous with a godly jealous. See, that ain't our jealous. Where some of our jealousy ain't godly jealous. We just mad because we ain't got what they got. But he said, with a godly jealousy, what else does he say? For I betrothed you to one husband. See, listen, I hooked you up with the church. I hooked you up with my son. I have betrothed you. You are engaged. You are married to the church. I hook that up. I'm the love connector. I'm the matchmaker. And what else does he say? That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Okay, now, you are pure. You are chaste. I'm presenting you to my son. Yes, I'm a jealous guy. See, the word jealous in this text, in the Greek word is zeal, where we get our English word zeal. Now, this means that God is full of of, of a tender attachment towards us. He loves us. He is zealous of us. God loves us so much that he has an overwhelming concern 
that we might be seduced from the simplicity of the gospel. God is jealous with a godly jealousy. So yes, God does get jealous when we let something or someone disrupt that relationship. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 now. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 38. See, we need to thank God for his goodness because God wants an alliance with us, y'all. He wants us to be for him and he wants to be for us. You know what? You think about this for a second. You think about the man and woman relationship, right? <clears throat> Say, for instance, one of the parties go astray. And the other one is like, all right, so, so what? Then the party that went astray is mad because the other party is not jealous. Man, you ain't jealous because I went astray. And you got to wonder, well, was there any love there before? You don't even care that I did this or did that. So that probably tells us that there probably wasn't a whole lot there in the beginning. So our, our, our understanding gets clearer with this text in Romans. Romans chapter 8, start reading in verse 38. What does he say? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. Okay, life or death, keep reading. Nor angels. Nobody nor, up in heaven, go ahead, read. Nor principalities. None of this stuff up there. Nor powers. No powers. Nor things present, nor things to come. I don't care what's happening right now. I don't care what's going to happen in the future. Keep going. Nor height. Nor depth. I don't care how high it is. I don't care how low it is. Nor any created thing. Or any created thing. Shall be able to separate us. It's not going to separate us. From the love of God. From the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody get Mark and Bad. Paul says, I serve a jealous God, and nothing is going to separate me from his love. The word separate means to place room in between. You know, that's one of the spiritual tragedies in the body of Christ. There's just too much room between God's people and God. We put too much stuff in between us and God. There's too much room. Listen, there should not even be a fraction of a millimeter between me and God. We need to be up close and personal with the Father. We should purpose in our hearts that we are not going to let activities separate us from God. That we're going to let family get in the way of us and God. Technology get in the way of us and God. Selfish desires get in the way of us and God. Our personal agenda is not going to separate us from the love of God. We ought to thank God that he want to be all up in our space. You know, some folks get all up on you like, come on, man, get in my space. You're too close. But we ought to let God just get all up in our space. I don't want no room between me and God. And we ought to be thankful for his goodness that he want to be up close. That's why the Bible says, draw near unto God. Yes. Call on his name while he is near. It's all about closeness. It's all about relationships. Notice verse 3 back in uh, Nahum chapter 1. Verse 3 of the text says that the Lord is slow to anger. Praise God. Hallelujah. And great in power, it will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds and in the dust of his feet. Here's another reason why we need to thank God for his goodness. Because he's slow to get slow to anger, y'all. Yeah. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not that slow to anger. I mean, I don't get mad quickly, but stuff do Tick me off to the eyes to take Timothy sometimes. Well, yes. There are some things that quickly ignite my anger. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if God's anger was quick as mine, man, he would have took me out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all would have came with me. Yeah. Some of y'all would have went before me. <laughs> but I'm thankful that he has always had this characteristic. Mm -hmm. God was full of anger. When the children of Israel wandered through the desert and kept complaining, but God kept on blessing. 
God was full of anger when Jeremiah preached for 50 years and didn't have not one convert. God was full of anger when Abraham, the father of faith, lied to Abimelech and said, Sarah's my sister and not my wife. God was full of anger when Peter denied his son three times. God was full of anger when Saul was persecuting the church. God was full of anger when you and I told that lie the other day. God was full of anger when you and I said a bad word the other day. God was full of anger when we had that impure thought the other day. God was full of anger when he waits for those that have heard his word week after week and still choose not to be baptized for forgiveness of sins. God is slow to anger right now as he looks down on our imperfection. Thank God that he's slow to anger. Thank God that he don't get mad at me so fast. That's why Brother James tells us, he says, be quick to listen and slow to anger. Yes. Too many folk just walk around mad all the time. Yeah, yeah. And for what? Mm -hmm. See, you cannot reach your full potential in Christ walking around angry all the time. Yeah. You're consumed with wrath all the time and not consumed with the Father. Yeah. Yeah. Anger is like self-destruction. Listen, listen. Anger is an acid that can do more to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything to which it is poured. It does more damage to the vessel in which it is stored so when you out there mad at everybody and pouring out your wrath on them, it, it, people ain't even trying to hear what you got to say. Yeah. Mean mugging everybody, coming in there with a, with a mad face and then nobody, even, you think people care? But yet it's acid within you. You're poisoning yourself. Be slow to anger like God is. The name says in that same verse, that God has his way like a whirlwind in the storm and the clouds out of dust to his feet. That simply reminds us that God is in control. Our God is a sovereign God and the winds and the waves obey his will. When the storms of life rise against you and the winds of adversity are at buffeting your life, you will discover that there is a place of refuge for the child of God. You will discover that there is a place of peace in the midst of the storm. You will discover that God is directing your path for his glory. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. He's going to direct your path. See, listen, the word path refers to the unmarked ways of life. Oh, Lord. Yes. We don't know. We don't know about this path. Mm. We don't know about this journey. Mm. But God knows. Yes. And he's the only one that knows. Mm. That's why we can't lean on our own understanding. Right. We can't trust in self. Mm -hmm. Job understood this truth in Job 23 and 10. David understood this truth in Psalm 37. Sometimes we don't know which way the wind is going to blow us. Yes. We just don't know how treacherous the storm is going to be. We just don't know how devastating the weather conditions of life are going to be. But what we do know is God is good. Amen. What we do know is God is in control yes. when life seems like it's out of control. Yes. What we do know is that God orders the steps of a good man. Amen. What we do know is that God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen. I might not know my path, but the good Lord above knows my path. And we need to learn that truth even though we can't see the way, all we gotta know is that he is the way, Amen. the truth, and the life. Amen. Thank God for his goodness Amen. to have complete control over my path. It gets rough sometimes, but I know God is leading me. And he's going to direct me on this journey. So in verse 4 of our text, the Bible says he rebuked the sea and made it dry up. 
and drive off all the rivers. Bashan languish and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languish. Nahum continues to describe the power of God. He says God can dry up the sea. Now, so, now see, this, 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 this thought is hard to fathom, knowing that this world, this earth, is made up of more water than it is land. But God can dry up everybody of water. He has all power. He says, Bashan and Carmel with us. Well, why does Brother Nahum use these geographical locations to describe God's power? Well, Bashan is about 1,000 square miles. Let me try to help put that distance in perspective. From here to Alabama, Sister Kiki, is about a thousand miles. Amen. You done been up and down that road. Amen. The Stallworth family, up and down. Some of y'all may be from Alabama. That's a long ride. Okay. My wife and I was just talking about that the other day. We said we don't never want to take that drive again in life. <laughs> we pray that it's enough on Visa and MasterCard to get a plane ticket. <laughs> but we don't want to drive to Alabama no more. So that's about a thousand miles south. Take that same distance and go east. That same distance and go west. A thousand miles, square miles, is Bashan. It was known to have large forests filled with beautiful oak trees. And the land was fertile. But the Bible said all oh, that could wither before God. The brother Nahum, why do you make mention of Mount Carmel? Well, it was a high mountain. This mountain was about 13 miles long. Let me help you put that in perspective. That's about from here to Southern Tech. A mountain that high that goes that long. And it stood about 1,600 feet above sea level. And the slope spilled into the Mediterranean Sea. And it contained trees that bore, that bear fruit. But even with all of that, it can wither by the power of God. Yes. Nahum also makes mentions of the blossoms of Lebanon because of its odorous flowers, its aromatic shrubs and, and vines and the wonderful fragrance that yield the smell of Lebanon. You just walk through Lebanon and it just smells good. All the, the fragrances of the beautiful flowers. The cultivation ran about 6,000 feet. Every available space in Lebanon, utilized for fig trees and vines and mulberry trees and, 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 and olive groves and these mountains, listen, all of these things are emblems of richness, yeah. long-lasting beauty and fruitfulness and loftiness. But many of us saying that there is nothing in the world so blooming that God, by just the sound of his voice, can make it wither. So Nahum is saying, all that beautiful stuff, all that tremendous stuff, God is in control of all that. Now watch verse 5 and 6 as we get ready to come to a landing. Ha <laughs> ha, see? We laugh. Verse 5 and 6, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwelleth therein. Who could stand before his indignation? And who could abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. We stand in the presence of an awesome God. And if he is in complete control of nature, he is in complete control of your issues. If he can control all that, Lord knows he can control all this. If he can say, peace be still to the sea, he can say, peace be still to your problem. Amen. If he can cover fleece uh, without the morning dew and everything around it is wet, so enough he can cover us with his grace. When, 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 when he can open the Red Sea so his people can keep walking and then he can open up my mind and give me strength so I can fight on, I can keep living. Amen. If he can lie down in a boat and fall fast asleep, while the winds and the waves beat up on that boat, then I can lay my head down on cushions of comfort. I can lay down on sheets of satisfaction while the waves beat up on my life. Amen. I still could sleep in peace. Amen. 
Church, my God is a good God. And it segues way, right into verse number seven when he says the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust him. See, see, we are told that God knows who trusts him. He knows who has trust in him. He knows. The word knows means to know intimately, to know by experience. See, we try, we, we try to tell people about God all we want. See, it's our duty to introduce people to God because you got to live this stuff. It's hard to explain God's blessing sometimes. It's hard to explain my experience with the Father. The word trust means to flee to protection, to trust in God. The phrase reminds us that God knows his people. He knows who trusts him. He knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows what you're facing. He knows the details of your life. He knows your journey. He knows you intimately. He knows you comprehensively. He knows you completely. There is nothing about your life and no situation that has escaped his attention. He knows every hair on your head, Brother Bristol. Yes, he knows it all. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God knows you and he loves you. The text says he is a refuge, yes. a stronghold yes. in the times of trouble, yes. a fortified place of safety. Amen. See, we need to praise the Lord, for he has given us a place of refuge in times of trouble. Amen. Uh, don't worry. Listen, let me tell y'all this right now. Don't y'all worry one bit about the who the president-elect is. Don't y'all worry one bit. Because God is in control Amen. of all of our affairs. Amen. He is our place of peace in an unpeaceful Amen. world. Bridge over troubled yes. water. Amen. Shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, yes. Stronghold during yes. weak moments. Yes. Rock in the weary land. Yes. Bomb in Gilead. Oh, yes. My deliverer when I deviate. Yes. I armor against yes. Satan's army. Amen. He's my breastplate against backbiters. Yes. My force field against fiery darts. My helmet against hell's fire. My sword when I'm sorrowful. My protector over principalities. The lion king of the jungle. Protector of the realm. He is the refuge in time of trouble. Thank God for your goodness. Thank God for your goodness. Somebody said, you are known by the company you keep. <laughs> Sounds to me like the Lord's people are in good company. Amen. As long as you keep the company of God, Amen. you are in good company. Amen. God has saved us by his grace and brought us into his family. Amen. There is a heavenly acquaintance and that he gives us hope in the day of trouble. Amen. Let me just say this as I close. This might be a good time to come to him and praise him for his goodness. Yes. How often do we praise him for his goodness? We celebrate Thanksgiving and we're thankful for a lot of things, but are we thankful for the goodness of God? This might be a good time to get before the Lord and ask him to forgive you for doubting his goodness and for not trusting him. I end with this story. There's a little boy that grandmama house. Grandma said, how you doing, grandson? He said, well, you know, everything ain't going so well, Grandma. Everything in his life was going wrong. And so he told Grandma about his problems, what was going on in school, what was going on in his family, his community, et cetera, et cetera, friends and all. He was just having a rough time. So meanwhile, his grandmother was baking a cake while he was telling his story. So she asked his, her grandson, son, do, grandma, grandson, do, do you want a snack? Of course, you know how sons are, you know how boys are, we, we greeted, yeah, Grandma, I want a snack, yeah. So Grandma says, here, have some cooking oil, drink this. Grandson said, ew, Grandma, no, I ain't drinking no cooking oil. She says, all right, here, take a couple of raw eggs, let me scram them up, here, suck these down. No, yuck, Grandma, I don't want that. 
She says, all right, all right, here, take some flour. Let me put some baking soda in it. Just take this, eat, it. Just eat the flour on the baking soda. Oh, that's disgusting, Grandma. No, I don't want that. Grandma then says, all those things are yucky, aren't they? He says, yeah, they're yucky. Then Grandma said, yes, all of those things seem bad by themselves. Yeah. All right. But when they're all put together yeah. in the right way, uh -huh. they make a wonderful, delicious cake. Yeah. See, God works the same way in our lives. Mm -hmm. He takes all those bad things mixes them all up together and when we come out of the oven in the fire of tribulation it's just a beautiful triple decker chocolate German strawberry cheesecake carrot cake red velvet sweet potato cake it's good many times we wonder why we go through so much we always say man when they're raising pause and I'm going through something now, here comes something else. Listen, that's why James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Various. And when God is done with you, God, we delicious. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God is good, y'all. Let's put this thing in perspective and give him the praise that he's, that he's doing. I don't know what y'all experienced today, but we just need to thank God for his goodness. Thank you, Brother Nahum, for giving us this perspective. Because in the midst of difficulties, wrath and doom, he ends by saying God is good. In the midst of whatever is going on, whatever is going to go on, always remember that God is good. If you're here today and you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you need to be. So you can enjoy these spiritual blessings that we enjoy on a daily basis. Yeah. We are blessed beyond measure. Sometimes, church, we don't even know when we're being blessed. Mm -hmm. So you heard his word. I pray that you believe his word. Now change your life around. It's called repentance. Just say, you know what? I'm going to live for the Lord. And then confess Christ as the Son of God and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Be baptized and have your sins washed away today. No need for going through any classes, no need to get voted in, no need for a baptismal Sunday because that is not scriptural. You can be saved today. People in the Bible were saved right on the spot. And so you can come today and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins because God is good. And he want to protect you, he want to hold you, and he want to bless you. Listen, he has some things in store for you over here. Now he has a couple things over here for you. He has allowed you to wake up every day and give you another chance to get it right. But he has something over here that he has to withhold because you're over here. you got to come over here. There's too much space in between. Close the gap. Close the gap. Close the gap. Close until it ain't no gap. Y'all remember when I had a gap? I mean, y'all go way back. Close it up. Close the space. Close up the space. That's in between you and God. Now, if you're a member of the Church of Christ and you got some space, folk in the church got some space. God is over here. And we way over here. Come back. Come back. Close up that space. Come back. And we dedicate and we commit your life to the Lord. Why? Because God is good. Repeat after me. God is good. God is good. Let us all stand and have a closing song. I want to thank you again for tuning in to the Southwest Church of Christ YouTube channel. I pray that this message has caused you to make some changes in your lives. If you have any questions regarding the message, feel free to give us a call at any time or feel free to send us an email and we'll be glad to give you a Bible answer to your Bible question. Thanks again for tuning in and may the Lord bless you in a very special way.